Okay, we are live. Yeah. Uh, so I welcome all of you to this 11th uh, session of our masterclass on fertility series. So we have got a uh, tremendous response for the past uh, 10 classes. And uh, uh, we are uh, very grateful to everyone who have uh, joined us on live every single day for this past uh, 10 sessions. So today's topic will be follicular monitoring, which will be uh, taken mostly only on the practical points by Dr. J. Uh, so over to you, Dr. J. Okay. So see, I have designed this class where I'll be sharing a live video of doing follicle monitoring, okay, which we have recorded in today's patient. And uh, so we had, uh, we have recorded two videos actually. One is, uh, one is a live recording of follicle monitoring of the pre-ovulatory follicle, okay, which is used for, uh, which is predominantly used in IVF and IUI. And second is the routine follicle monitoring, okay. And I hope it is going to benefit each and every one of you. But before doing that, as usual, I will share the whiteboard. And uh, Shilpa, madam, please let me know if the whiteboard is visible. Okay. And uh, yeah, it is visible. It, Can you put yourself on spotlight, please? I mean, uh, that will help. No, currently you be on spotlight. It's okay. Yeah. Any which way you are the spotlight. So, fine. So, see, I'll draw this entire ovary for everyone. Okay. Please pardon my little shaky drawing because of the car. Okay. I'll try my best though. Okay, so we are going to look at follicle monitoring. All right. Now, what is very, very important for us to understand is that what we actually look at on day two and day three are the, we actually call it as antral follicle count, right? So these are antral follicles. That is AFC. Antral. A stands for antral. Okay. Now, before this reaches antral follicle, there are something called as preantral follicles. Okay. And before it goes to preantral follicles, there are something called as primordial follicles and primary follicles. Okay, so I'll just call it as primary follicle, and I will also call it as the stage before that as preantral follicle. I mean, sorry, primordial follicle. Okay, now what is important for us to understand in this entire series is that this guy and this guy. These are the two people who are absolutely not dependent on any form of gonadotropins. These guys are independent of FSH, independent of LH. These guys are independent of all types of gonadotropins. Okay. Please understand one thing. It all actually begins with an oocyte. Okay. So this oocyte is present somewhere here. It attracts some of the cells surrounding it to form something called as granulosa cells. All right. Now, once... It becomes slightly more mature once there is a slightly more amount of maturity which gets induced inside this. Okay, it attracts this oocyte attracts some more amount of follicles and more, 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 more starts to develop, you know. And then at this stage, okay, it becomes a preantral follicle. And when it becomes a preantral follicle, very, very, very important for all of us to understand that it is now going to be dependent on FSH and LH. Okay. So the preantral follicles are the guys who are dependent on FSH and LH. Never forget that. The reason why we are talking about this is you will understand everything in a very short span of time once I correlate this with your stimulation. Okay. Preantral follicles. I will draw, okay, this preantral follicles actually along with beautiful granulosa cells, you know, large amount of granulosa cells also begin to attract formation of something called as theca cells, okay. These theca cells are actually just the ovarian stroma, which then form and ultimately this forms the antral follicle count, which we see on the day two or day three. The reason why it is called as the, this thing is because now the oocyte is present here inside, okay. And inside this oocyte, which is which is formed here, these granulosa cells have formed there. Okay. And then there is a fluid collection which has come. It is actually the follicular fluid 
what you are trying to monitor when you monitor a follicle. Okay, please try and understand monitoring of the oocyte inside or monitoring of the cumulus oophorus complex, the COC is not so easy. Okay, that is the first thing. So, whenever we are looking at follicle monitoring, it is important for us to understand that we are trying to look at it in order to check at the response of this guy, FSH, LH on this. Okay. The reason why I mentioned before that you will understand is because everything is driven by FSH ideally. Okay. Everything is driven by FSH as a result of which if there is no pregnancy in the previous cycle, the corpus luteum which is formed, the corpus luteum which is formed in the ovary, this corpus luteum would degenerate. This degeneration of the corpus luteum would induce FSH to go up. This FSH would rescue all these preantral follicles, which have been recruited and which have formed preantral follicles on that day. And some of them might go to develop the antral follicles. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever stimulation begins or when nature stimulates in the form of FSH, what typically happens inside this follicle? Okay is something like this please try and understand this very important all is driven by the oocyte so the oocyte is present here obviously between the oocyte and these granulosa cells there are multiple gap junctions so that they help each other grow okay and this allows in the formation of lot of fsh receptors inside this follicle okay as a result of which there is a fsh driven Again, this is going to be a very important point. There is going to be an FSH-driven estrogen growth inside this follicular fluid. Okay, I'm sure all of us completely understand the two-cell, two-gonadotropin theory here. Okay, it's a very small thing, but I'll just brief all of you about it. The theca cells which are present here, right? We all know these theca cells come from the ovarian stroma. It is the theca cells which express LH receptors, which allows cholesterol from the blood to get converted into androgen. Okay. And this androgen then migrates into the granulosa cell and this granulosa cell has FSH receptors, which then in turn convert androgen into estrogen through aromatase activity. Now, this word aromatase is important because this is the basis of using letrozole. But this theory, you know, 2 cell 2 gonadotropin theory starts to apply from this stage onwards, which results in the formation of one follicle as a dominant follicle and the other follicle, what we think, begin to atrophy in a natural cycle. Exact reverse, exact reverse ha happens when you are doing a stimulated cycle. In a stimulated cycle, it is so easy. There is supraphysiological level of FSH which you have stimulated. As a result of which, all this, number one, number two, number three, all of them will end up reaching this size. And that is something which we will be wanting to monitor. Because there is supraphysiological FSH, supraphysiological estradiol is produced. And because there is supraphysiological estradiol, there is an abnormal LH pulse. And because there is an abnormal LH pulse, when you are monitoring these follicles, you must understand that irrespective of the situation, your HMG response is going to be same as RFSH. In fact, your HP HMG response is going to be slightly better than RFSH. And we will come to that also in a little while. At the end of these things, what is going to happen is very simple. Because of the presence of oocyte, which is wanting to become mature and which is wanting to get ruptured, Okay, these granulosa cells and all these guys are become going to become very powerful and you are going to have one large follicle which is going to become the pre-ovulatory follicle and this pre-ovulatory follicle carries blood flow. Okay, okay. So at this stage, beyond 15 millimeter in size, estradiol levels would peak out and this E2 peak is very, very important for LH2 surge. Okay, and this E2 peak can only be induced by a follicle more than 15 millimeter. That is because of the 2 cell 2 gonadotropin theory. This estrogen, when it peaks out, it ensures that the granulosa cells start to express LH receptors. Okay, I will probably take a master class on this if somebody wants to understand how exactly it happens. And this LH receptors, which then get formed inside here, okay, these LH receptors then get formed. It helps in that progesterone formation, which ultimately causes ovulation. Okay, so all this thing, 
and then there is a stage of corpus luteum correct so all these three things we understand when we end up doing follicular monitoring and all these things in fact form the absolute basis of gynecology for any ovarian stimulation when we look at the live videos which i am going to be putting out now you are going to clearly understand what we are trying to see and i'm going to cover each and every small point in these live videos okay these are small videos both the videos are just 2 2 minutes each and they will give you a crystal clear idea okay so please remember some rules before follicular monitoring it is almost always done on transvaginal ultrasound the transvaginal ultrasound probe has multiple amount of frequencies but it is always adjusted to a suitable frequency in order to ensure that even deep follicles can be visualized very nicely the minute you reduce the frequency of your probe you will be able to achieve more depth this is a simple principle of sonography this is a simple principle of physics which is applied in ultrasound as well okay so there is a much there is a button on every sonography machine to adjust the depth the minute you adjust the depth you will realize the frequency of the probe keeps on changing okay so just keep that in mind second thing what you are monitoring is actually the preantral follicular fluid that is what you are trying to monitor when you are looking at a follicular ultrasound and third thing all our ultrasound machines come with a color doppler setting we are going to speak a little bit about the color dopplers in this entire video and i will cover one small few lines in the end about 3d folliculometry 3d folliculometry requires a 3d machine 3d machine then requires installation of those softwares which will help you calculate the folliculometry and i will obviously give you my private experience on that okay so no one is supposed to judge me on that all right now with all these things i will again ask uh, shilpa madam's permission this time i want to share my uh, this thing screen uh, so i'll just share my screen okay fine oh okay can you see my screen only you we can see oh Okay, wait. Okay, just a minute. I think it should now be visible. Yeah, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. So these are the videos which I shot in the morning today. I just thought I'll show you. okay so this is what our basic ultrasound looks like remember the first rule zoom it okay always zoom it you saw what i did i zoomed in never ever try to do a folliculometry without zooming it please take home this point lot of people have very remote access follicles and they make huge mistakes because they have not zoomed it it is the simplest thing on the right side of your machine there is a button like a scroll like a scroll which will allow you to zoom in and zoom out always do that always measure your follicles on a zoomed image okay this is a day 7 scan so the patient has already taken approximately 6 injections of hmg okay and she is going to be starting antagonist from today freeze the image once you freeze the image if you want to take just one measurement take the largest longitudinal measurement from inside to inside like the largest perpendicular measurement from inside to inside okay should you be like super smart and you don't like taking just one measurement no problem you can take three measurements then and take out the mean okay i will come to this aspect of taking three measurements at this stage what i mean at this stage of day 6 and day 7 taking two or three measurements doesn't really matter the reason why i took two in this is for demonstration purposes you can see one reading is 13 mm second reading is 12 mm third reading is again 13 mm so will you consider this to be 12 or will you consider this to be 13 it doesn't really matter 12 and 13 both are going to be equally same because the minute it recrosses 10 to 11 mm and touches 12 mm you are supposed to add antagonist any which ways in your frix protocol okay again see we are measuring so we have zoomed in never ever forget to zoom in i have shown this for demonstration purposes see what happens is when you add vascularity it is important that you put your box 
approximately 3 to 5 millimeters in excess of the size of the follicle which you are trying to study. And at this point, at 12 to 13 millimeters, there is no major vascularity because, because very simple, because the peak of estrogen is yet to occur. Because the peak of estrogen has not occurred, there is no massive angiogenesis which occurs at this point in time. You require estradiol peak to be sustained by a single follicle more than 200 to 250 picograms per ml and that has to be sustained for a period of at least 13 to 14 hours for angiogenesis to set in. As a result of which, with just this small amount of follicles, you will not have massive angiogenesis. As a result of which, at this stage, even if OHSS is about to set in, okay, the early signs will be collection. And if you see that there is OHSS setting it at this time, it is the earliest warning sign on follicular metry on your day 6, day 7 scan. Okay, so this is the live video which finishes the day 6, day 7 scan. And I will switch to another live video of the pre-ovulatory follicles now. See this. This is where we want to give trigger. What is our criteria for giving trigger? Already we have enlarged it. I mean, already we have zoomed it. Okay. Through our TVS probe. Okay. And once we have zoomed in, we have frozen the image. Now, again, the largest longitudinal perpendicular diameter, 18.6 millimeter. Very good. I am very happy. Second follicle should also be approximately 18. Now, see how you can take the measurements. You can take it in one direction like this, or you can take it other end to other end. What your radiologist is going to report is a question mark because you will think that he has reported it as 14, whereas actually it was 18. Okay. So these mistakes are common in folliculometry. Now see, I'm taking the largest, longest to longest. It is 20 millimeter. Somebody will take it at the other plane and report it to be 14 millimeter. Actually. As a result of these differences, what we try to tell people is that kindly you have more than two or three follicles, more than 18 millimeter, even if somebody else has done the ultrasound, then also it is absolutely no need to worry. Okay. Now, when I add Doppler, always add PD. There is a button on your scan machine called PD. It is called pulse Doppler. Okay. Always do power Doppler study on this, please. Okay. It is not your color flow. You can see that this pulsatile Doppler is different. You can see beautiful vascularity because there is supraphysiological estrogen. There is supraphysiological angiogenesis as well. This angiogenesis, typically you should be watching it as covering the septum of at least three angles. Okay. This is for basic quick assessment. Okay. Now, if you want to really dwell deep inside this science, okay, then I will show you something different. Okay, I think I have, uh, I think I have not, uh, I think I have not taken the, um, I, had, I think I have not taken the video of, um, of that. I think I have not taken the video of that, but I'm going to, I'm going to describe that for everyone. See what typically happens is my friends, whenever you have a situation where you want to cross this stage and you want to be one level above everyone and you want to put 3D Doppler, that means 3D power Doppler inside the follicles. Remember, it will work the best for your IUI cycles. It will not work very nicely for IVF cycles. Please remember that because in your IUI cycles, in your natural intercourse cycles, you are dependent on that singular follicle and you are looking into 3D so that you can give an estimate to the patient if this follicle is containing a healthy oocyte inside it or not. That is the key thing and that is why these things are important in IUI cycles, okay? Another thing, in IUI cycles, when you have monofollicular or maximum two or three follicles which are stimulated, there is a lot of ovarian stroma which is available with you. Because a lot of ovarian stroma is available, when you do a 3D surrounding a particular follicle, okay? surrounding a particular follicle, please remember that you will be able to capture beautiful 3D images of that single follicle. Okay. And when you can capture these beautiful images, there is a simple software of 3D folliculometry depending on which machine you are using, depending on G, depending on Samsung, whatever machine you are using. See, I am using Samsung. I have used uh, till E6 radiance 
on GE Evolution platform before I shifted to Samsung. Both the machines, I was very comfortable. There was something called as 3D follicle uh, software, which was available on Evolution. There is a different software for that called 3D anti-scan, which is available on Samsung, which can be extrapolated. What is the thing that you are supposed to see? You are supposed to see the amount of blood vessels on 3D, which is something called as volume index, okay, or VI, what we normally call as volume of angios, volume of blood vessels going there. And there is an another measurement which is available. You don't have to do anything inside it. It is a machine driven calculation, which tells you the amount of flow inside it. Okay, amount of flow inside that follicle, which is called as flow index. Please don't think of anything else beyond this. Apart from this, it also gives you the volume of the follicle, obviously, because it is on 3D and very simple. When you are looking at, looking at it on 3D, please remember any follicle having a volume more than 4 and se up to 7 millimeter, but up four, between 4 to 7 cc is considered to be a good volume follicle. Okay, just keep one thing in mind. If any one of you wants to go very deep and look at peak systolic velocities of these vessels on the septation, peak systolic ve velocity more than 12 centimeter per second on a pre-ovulatory follicle is considered to be very good. And if in case you are looking at machine generated automatic RI values, RI value of less than 0 0.4 is considered to be very good. Okay, but beyond this, don't try to extrapolate these findings or don't try to extrapolate this entire thing on every patient of IVF or every other patient which you are looking at. Please remember this. Okay. The reason why I'm being so specific about this is there are going to be lots and lots and lots of variations based on the type of machine which you have. There are going to be lots of variations based on your inclination to study these things. Because if one particular person is doing it and is getting good results, it doesn't really mean that the other person can also invest 80, 90 lakh rupees in buying an expensive ultrasound machine and looking at these values and get the same results. Okay. Very simply, I will put it in one line. There is a something called as angle of insonation. Okay. The angle with which you are projecting the beam of Doppler onto a particular blood vessel. If you are tilting the angle of insonation by 30 degrees, the same value in the same observer will be different. Okay. As a result of which, kindly look into basics, which I showed in two videos, more than looking into 3D, 4D folliculometry and all these things because the value which it helps you establish is not very greatly different. Yes, it will add to your success rates by 5%. And that too in your IUI cycles, but it will not at all affect your success rates in IVF. And that is my personal opinion. And please remember, I use the most high-end machine from Samsung, which is Samsung Hera W9. This is an this is a machine which costs around 75 lakh rupees. Okay, it is an expensive machine because we do 2D echoes as well. So we know uh, the utility and that is why I'm putting it out as a personal statement. Okay. Research could be different and individual way, individual reporting could be different. So if you look at it in my hands, the report will be fantastic. But if you try to copy it, you will not be able to do it. All right. I think with this and demonstration of those two videos, I finish. But before I finish, I also want to tell one important point. Never look at follicle alone. Always correlate follicle with the endometrium. Your ability to decide everything in an IUI cycle is going to be totally dependent on the endometrial appearance along with that developing lead follicle. Even if you are taking this for modified natural cycles in embryo transfers, even if you are doing in IUI cycles, no matter what you are trying to do, everything is going to be interdependent on each other. And as a result of this, please keep this very, very important thing in your mind. Do not just randomly Okay, do this thing. Always correlate the developing follicle with the endometrium. We have discussed what happens in that half dose antagonist when you want to have a follicle which is 17, 18 millimeter in size, but endometrium is 6 millimeter. You want the endometrium to go, you can give a half dose antagonist. Remember, the max you can allow the follicle to grow is up to 21 millimeters or so. Maximum is 22 actually may. 
But if in case it crosses that particular value, if in case it ends up crossing that particular value, you are going to be in trouble because that follicle will become a post mature follicle. All right. So please keep that in mind. With this, I finish the session. I will be able to answer questions probably for two or three minutes if people have questions. And then we can wind up and I will answer the rest of the questions to everyone on WhatsApp. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, see, there are three things which are very important in follicular monitoring. One is the ovarian response. Second is the timing of trigger. And third thing is the dosage of gonadotropins that you want to decide on. So, you said that, yes, I mean, the follicular monitoring that you do for the ovarian response, you have uh, clearly told us. So, for the trigger, you said uh, you will look at uh, three walls, uh, uh, blood flow, and then the size of the follicle. So, at what size you trigger? No, I will trigger anywhere between 17 to 20 millimeters. All right. This is my thing. I don't really specifically look into blood flow on every follicle. Please try and understand. The importance of looking at follicular blood flow is more, especially in cases when you are doing IUI and natural cycles. This may not be very high when you are looking at IVF cycles. Please understand this. Okay. And uh, do you combine it with uh, uh, monitoring of uh, uh, blood levels of hormones like E2? Uh... So I have told this multiple times in multiple sessions. Most of my stimulations are going to be associated with letrozole. And because they are letrozole assisted stimulations, I do not try to look at estrogen levels in almost every case. But yes, if somebody has to do it day two, day three, looking at it is something which is important. And please try and understand beyond that, if in case you want to look into it, nothing else really matters. Day six, day seven or prior to the day of trigger. Beyond this, you don't really have to look into it. Okay. Okay. So the dosage of the monodotrophins, do you look only at the baseline scan on day two or do you consider uh, the AMH value, the age and BMI, everything to decide? Or you have to... So I have standardized, as you know, I have standardized the last cycle as well. If it is in IUI cycles, it is normally 150 units. If it is IVF cycles, it is normally 300 international units. Okay. So do you take endometrial volume at any point in time? I mean, do you believe in it? Endometrial volume more than 4 cc is considered to be good. Practically, when you are starting your stimulation, there is no much role of looking into it. Maybe Maybe mid-cycle after five days of stimulation, you can look at that. But again, as far as cavity is concerned, no, the amount of volume which you will miss out when you are looking at endometrial volume, unless you are trained very nicely, is going to be very, very high. Okay. Yeah. So for consultants who are not doing their own scans, so for them, yeah. uh, what is your suggestion? Like they uh, see monitoring, in fact, doesn't really change the outcomes. So it is only for Correct. us no whether like you know i mean we have to increase the dose reduce the dose but that also i think you don't do it in your setup about varying the i dose. don't no i don't and i don't even recommend it remember there is a supra physiological amount of fsh which is going to be mandatory for you to ensure that the follicles cross that stage of getting recruited okay so if in starting at 150 units, then making it 225, then making it 300, you are not going to get a superbly good outcome in those cases. You might as well start with 300. What is the problem? You know? Uh, and uh, you always use uh, fixed protocol to start the antagonist and you don't recommend flexible protocol. Yeah, yeah always. All. No, no, so, it is up to you to use flexible or not but i use flick fix protocol because i have a large volume of cases and i cannot end up uh, you know changing that particular thing because the worst thing that can happen to a busy practice is to have an lh surge okay that one patient will spoil your reputation thinking that doctor was not careful and at all points in time my reputation is much more important than one extra dose of antagonist okay Okay, so uh, do you do baseline scans for all patients like uh, uh, IUI and IVF both or uh, you don't uh, believe in doing baseline scan on day two? Definitely my team does base baseline scans day two, day three, whenever the patient comes in or even for random start protocol. The, the All of them 
do have a baseline scan and on the baseline scan if you have antral follicles let's assume you have a variation here let's assume you have a small follicular cyst this follicular cyst if it is more than 1.5 to 2 cm but if in case your voice is not heard sorry if it is a non functional cyst if it is a non functional cyst you can easily correlate by doing serum estradiol levels and if the estradiol level is less than 50 you can binda start stimulation okay aspirate the cyst if you are so worried but start stimulation all right okay so for iui cycles after you do the baseline scan and start the stimulation when do you see them again do you see them on day 8 or day 10 or you have you don't see them at all you call them on day 12 no i normally i normally do one scan for all patients on day 6 day 7 just to ensure even in iui if i might need a half dose antagonist or a low dose hcg or whatever okay and the second scan is pre trigger that is day 10 okay so day 2 day 6 and day 10 for iui and for ivf same absolutely the same absolutely the same okay yeah um there is no need to call them daily yeah huh? or every alternate day no need not okay. more than three scans in a particular stimulation cycle okay okay yeah so uh, i think we'll take the rest of the questions uh, uh, on the groups uh, is that okay okay thank you yeah so yeah i am at the i am above am i they are calling me for security